Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody who has joined uh, today's webinar. Welcome. Hi, my name is uh, Howard Maggot. I am the uh, Director of Sales for Logarithm for the Midwest and in all of Canada. We appreciate your, your time today and for taking some time to learn a little bit more about, about Logarithm and our Network Monitor Network Forensic Tool. Uh, I'd like to introduce Rob McGovern. He is the Senior Technical Product Manager for Logarithm. He is responsible for the Network Monitor and Network Forensic uh, Tool. Some of the key items you're going to learn today uh, on this webinar is what is Network Monitor and its important role it plays in, in your security operations overall strategy. We're going to provide you real-life use cases that highlight the power of Network Monitor, kind of show you kind of a day in the life of how Network Monitor can help you increase your time to detect and respond to cybersecurity threats that are out there today. So with that said, again, welcome and thank you for your time. Um, I will now hand things over to Rob McGovern. Hello and uh, welcome everybody. I'm Rob McGovern. I'm technical product manager for our network monitor product, which means I'm deeply involved in the design architecture, the uh, prioritization of features, when we build things and how we build them. Uh, so what I'm going to cover today is how to use network monitor to fill the gaps that we see in the rest of our cybersecurity posture. Quite often we think of uh, cybersecurity, we talk about firewalls and intrusion protection systems and anti-malware, uh, even talk a lot about SIM, especially with logarithm. All of these things are great at what they do. A firewall is designed to make a very fast decision, should I allow traffic in or should I block it? Intrusion protection, very much the same sort of way. Is this bad or is this good? If it's good, I'm going to ignore it. If it's bad, I'm going to raise an alarm or do something about it. You know, anti-malware is going to look at uh, information that's already landed on your endpoint or your system try to do some analysis on it and say, is this good or bad? Uh, but what we're missing is what happens in between. You know, what gets through the firewall? What gets past the IPS? Uh, what happens if the malware isn't detected by the anti-malware? How do we know that things are going on? We don't have the evidence. And, you know, the SIM is only as good as the evidence or the logs that we can pull in. So we need network analytics as the critical piece of this puzzle uh, for two main reasons. The first is malware doesn't write logs. Once something bad has happened to your system, uh, some piece of software has gotten on there. You've got some sort of command and control traffic going on. It's not going to write nice logs to the, uh, the Windows security log saying, hey, I'm about to exfiltrate a couple of gigs of data. In fact, it usually doesn't tell you anything. It tries very hard not to tell you anything. So you can't capture that evidence by looking at the endpoints alone or by looking at your servers and systems alone. You have to generate that evidence some other way of where is this happening, what is going on, what information is flowing back and forth. One of the things we know, uh, just even as recently as this year's uh, Verizon Data Breach Incident Report, uh, over 80% of the incidents that they could actually analyze had a network component. Somewhere, somehow along the line of whatever that uh, incident breach was, the system that was breached or the, uh, the malware that was being used to make that breach was communicating over the network. So if we can capture that network traffic, understand it, analyze it, classify it, we can create our own logs and generate a new data source for our SIM, for our analysis, that's going to capture what's going wrong that the rest of our systems would miss. Second reason we need it, and this kind of comes from our, our incident response team here at Logarithm, but uh, they're, one of their favorite phrases is network packets never lie. Uh, if you've ever had to deal with, as an example, a ransomware incident, uh, you go back to the person who was hit with the ransomware and you say, okay, so uh, you, your computer was encrypted at uh, 810 this morning. Uh, which websites did you go to? And they kind of look at you and look at the watch and say, it's 2 o'clock in the afternoon. I can't remember what websites I went to at 810. Or they look at you and say, you're the security expert. You tell me which websites I went to that were bad. Or they say, well, I'm not really going to tell you because at 8 o'clock in the morning I was actually downloading a Game of Thrones episode that I intended to watch in the afternoon. Uh, so I'm not going to tell you that. I'm, I'm going to make up some other stories about, uh, hey, I just went to CNN. Right? You're not going to have the evidence. You're not going to have the information you want. Unless you have that network traffic, you can actually reconstruct the full sequence of events. And sure, you can sometimes get this from endpoints, but at the end of the day, that ransomware came over the network. And if you want to see it, and you want to see where it came from, what it did, how it got there, you want to do a real analysis on it, you need to have those network packets. Because that fundamentally is the truth. That's the one part of the equation of what malware does uh, that can't be manipulated. You know, Windows logs can be manipulated. Uh, systems, uh, anti-malware can be shut down by 
malware. Uh, but the network packets, what came into the system, never lies. So if you have that, you have your evidence, you have your picture to go do a reconstruction to understand what really happened to take the right steps to both re remediate that incident as well as to prevent future incidents. So these two themes kind of really come heavily into play for us with uh, Network Monitor is generating our own data about things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see and then capturing the real, true, honest to ground truth because that combination tied together gives us what we need to do really solid threat detection. Did something bad actually happen? Uh, as well as then incident response. I know exactly what happened so I can have a real solid conversation. Um, it's one thing to, again, go to that, uh, that poor user hit with malware and say, hey, do you happen to remember which emails you might have clicked on this morning or which websites you went to? It's another thing altogether different to say, hey, during this morning, uh, you went to these seven websites and, and uh, we went and looked at these five and there's nothing there. These two had questionable drive-by advertisements, so we're pretty sure that's where it came from. You know, one, you're talking about trying to find evidence, trying to find that thread you can pull to go do an, an incident response or, or figure out if something bad actually happened through that vector. Uh, the other, you've got the evidence. You've got a real conversation. You can talk to the right people. You can analyze the right things, shorten your whole time to both detect that respond or detect that incident and respond to it because, again, you're evidence-driven. So how do we get there? Start by collecting traffic. Uh, Network Monitor is a passive collector. We're going to grab everything we can see off of a, like a tap or a span port, um, not in lines. So we're not going to slow down your network traffic. We're going to read it offline. From there, we start classifying. Now, a lot of systems that do network analysis were really built for IT operations. And this is where you see like your net flows and your S flows. Uh, they're just trying to tell you, hey, system A talked to system B and sent as much data back and forth. Uh, for threat detection and incident response, we want to do a lot more. We're actually going to classify all the way up at network layer 7, which is the application layer. So not only are we going to be able to tell you that uh, it was TCP traffic or UDP traffic or it went to this port or that port, we're also going to tell you what that application was. And with our, our latest release, we're classifying close to 3,000 different applications, uh, everything from things that we want to clear as being relatively safe or known safe, like uh, you know, Skype or Slack communications if we allow them, all the way to things that are, are known bad behaviors and some that are known um, not necessarily bad behaviors, but just sort of corporate responsibility type things. So if you want to see when your, uh, your staff is going to Pandora, you don't have to go try to find which IP addresses are Pandora and then run a query against your firewall saying how many times did these IP addresses get hit. Uh, we actually classify that traffic as Pandora. You can just run a quick query against it and see it. Uh, malicious, probably not. Against policy, maybe, maybe not. Um, but it's that kind of classification that lets us really differentiate the haystack of all of our network traffic. We're coloring each piece of hay something different. We're giving lots of rich metadata and characteristics on it so that we know how to separate out and tease out what's a threat and what isn't and how to find what we need to respond to in an incident. So again, not only do we classify at Layer 7, depending on that application, uh, we extract metadata. Uh, so depending on the application, we will grab uh, several thousand or up to 10,000, I think, different types of metadata around it. So as an example, if it's encrypted traffic, we grab all the parameters related to the SSL certificate. If it's not, you won't see those parameters because obviously they're, they're not relevant. Uh, so lots of rich metadata to, again, help us with this process of doing good threat detection and good incident response. Uh, next, we want to execute automated analytics. Uh, it's great to have all this metadata, but we don't want to put the burden now on an analyst who has to understand every single application and every single protocol and go look and say, is this happening today? Is this bad today? Uh, we want to put some automation into that. So with Network Monitor, we have a rules engine that's built on a standard rule language called Lua. Uh, if you've ever played, uh, most online games these days have uh, extension toolkits that are all written in Lua because it's really designed for super high performance, massive inline processing of uh, you know, data flow. So it works great for us as well. We can write our custom Lua rules to take advantage of all this metadata and all this classification and then alert us if we see certain patterns or anomalies or behaviors that uh, we really want to investigate. And we'll do a, a deep dive and demo here in just a second of those. And then, again, packets don't lie. So how are we going to capture our full packet data, store it, how long can we store it, and how do we find it? Uh, other packet capture solutions that we see out there are pretty indiscriminate. They're just going to capture everything. And then your only way to really pull back the data that you care about is by time slice. 
that have to go say, hey, this computer was infected between 8 and 8.30. I'm going to go pull back all of the traffic that went to it between 8 and 8.30. And now I have to go look at every single session and try to figure out which ones matter. But for us, by combining both our, our packet capture as well as that metadata, it becomes much, much easier to find what you're looking for. And then finally, part of the incident response is uh, showing that we can't be hit by this incident again, that whatever countermeasures we've built are going to give us the success and the, and the outcomes we expect. Or on the other side, maybe we're doing some hunting exercises. We're looking at things that our, our peers in the industry have had to deal with, and we want to run that uh, particular traffic through our system and see what it does. So we have the capability to replay PCAP sessions with industry standard uh, file formats and run with that. So now I'm going to jump into a demo of uh, Network Monitor. So what you're about to see is tied currently to our logarithm corporate traffic. So this is all uh, real traffic inside of our, our real corporate office. So sometimes I find interesting things and uh, you, know, you never know exactly what's going to happen with live data. To start with, we've got our, our main default dashboard here which is uh, an application analysis dashboard. We're looking at all of our traffic. We're showing the, uh, the top 10 applications by bandwidth. So who's talking the most on our system? Uh, today we can see we've got some unclassified TCP traffic. That's actually pretty normal for us. Uh, we've got iSCSI traffic, which is almost certainly going to be some backup processes that are running. Uh, some TDS, which is uh, actually SQL Server data. And not surprisingly, this uh, TDS traffic and the uh, TCP traffic are actually we do a lot of uh, high performance uh, testing against our own SIM environment. So we're capturing that traffic here in our, our engineering tab. So that's most of what these two are. Uh, some syslog traffic, which again is us doing that testing. And then some other things, including some unknowns where, you know, hey, that, that might be worth looking into. This dashboard is kind of just your basic bread and butter dashboard to just have a real quick overview of what's going on in the system. But the first use case I really want to get into is is something a little bit deeper or richer on what's really happening, not just the applications, but what's really happening inside my network. So to do this, I'm going to go to a new dashboard called a destination port dashboard. And this is a built-in dashboard. It's, uh, it's part of every uh, NetMon release these days. And on the left, I see this uh, donut diagram where the inner ring is telling me the destination port. Where's the traffic going? And this is of, of real value to me in understanding both the security and operational context of the network, because at the end of the day, the, the endpoint is usually associated with the application, and it gives me a great starting point to start filtering things out. So I can see that by session count, it's not by bandwidth, this is by how many times something reached out to that port and, and said something. 40% or so of my traffic is going to 5355. Now, 5355 is actually a DNS port. It's a, you know, kind of a broadcast DNS, so I would expect this to be 100% match, and sure enough it is, so that's good. That means I can probably ignore this whole wedge of the pie. My third ring out shows me where it's going to, so who's receiving this traffic. And then my fourth ring out is showing me who's calling, so where's this traffic coming from. Let's go to the next segment. This is a, a more interesting one, perhaps. This is 443. Uh, port 443, HTTPS. It's what we'd expect. We'd expect a lot of different applications on here and a lot of different systems. So some of this HTTPS we could classify, hey, that's a little unusual. We've got some TCP traffic that's not even HTTPS. That typically means something is using port 443 to do uh, tunneling or other systems, knowing that that's an open port. Probably safe, but worth looking into potentially. Uh, Outlook, classify that directly. Ignite, that's a big file share program we use inside of a logarithm to share um, data files, installations, and a few other things out with our customers. Uh, HTTP2 traffic, Office 365, and so on. And we get down into the smaller numbers here, and we start again potentially finding interesting security things. Uh, port 53, that's going to be the, the other side of DNS. And then some other things like a SQL Server port, that's actually a SIM port. Uh, 389 is, uh, I think, is LDAP. Yeah, I was right. Yay! Uh, port 80, so some web traffic. Now, what gets interesting here is, is this graph alone is going to break out just what's going on in the network. And I'm, I can already see there's a couple of things in here I might want to go look at, like, like this uh, blank TCP traffic on port 443. It's not HTTPS. It's not uh, HTTP2. It's not one of our known applications. It's something else using 443. So I might want to go dig into these a little bit. If I look on the right, I see that same information broken apart by time. And this also gives another whole flavor of analysis for me. What I'd like to do the most on this one is go to a 24-hour period. 
because in a 24-hour time frame, you start seeing things you wouldn't necessarily expect to obviously get from network traffic. Uh, the first thing we see is when do our employees uh, show up in the morning and when do they leave? So I've got two lines here for 443 and uh, 80. This is my, my typical web traffic. And you can see my web traffic has really died off hard about 5.30 yesterday and was completely gone by about 6 o'clock. Some baseline stuff going out there. Oh, no, that's uh, the DNS traffic, sorry. Some baseline stuff happening in the middle of the night. And then there's this weird spike at uh, 1 o'clock in the morning. Now, just on a visual, that's an anomaly that just jumps right out at you, is that at 1 o'clock in the morning, we had uh, a large number of sessions go out to the Internet when I don't have employees in the office and I don't expect employees in the office. So what's going on there? Now, as a security guy, one of my challenges my IT team is never going to tell me exactly what's going on in my network, so I'm going to have to reverse engineer a lot of things. So as an example, in this case, I, I have traffic going out at 1 o'clock in the morning. I can drill down into these and find out which IP addresses are, are generating this traffic. And now I can go back to my IT team and my operations team and say, evidence-based, from this time frame to this time frame, I see traffic from this destination to that, or this source to this destination. And that starts a real conversation. Uh, fact-based, easier to figure out what's going on. In this case, I've looked into this one several times. This is actually one of our automated build processes. At 1 o'clock in the morning, it kicks off a, a daily build, and part of that daily build is it goes out to uh, CentOS and several of our, our Linux repositories and pulls down kind of latest versions of operating systems and things. So to me, I happen to know that this one is safe, but it's a great visual anomaly that just pops right out of the graph. If I look at the, the next chart down here below, I can see uh, same thing by, by bandwidth now instead of by traffic count. So I can cross-correlate. Is this a lot of traffic by bandwidth? Are we pulling in large files? Are we seeing large movement of data? Uh, not really, because I don't see a corresponding spike in, in this graph. Uh, but it is a large spike by count. So we're really, really chatty to those systems, but we're not necessarily transferring a whole lot of data in or out. And then over on the right, I get a, a summary view. So again, a different way to look at the same data, pull it out, tease it all apart, and see what's going on and where it's going on. One of the things that jumps out to me here is port 53. This is a very well-known port. And this should be DHCP traffic. I'm seeing eight different types of applications there. That's unusual. Um, I should only see DHCP. So if I filter my chart, you can see I've got a filter now here for destination port is just 53. I can see DNS traffic is still my biggest. And let me filter one, one more thing. This language for the filtering up here is uh, Lucene. It's, again, a very standard language. If you're at all familiar with the uh, ELK stack, you're really looking at Kibana and uh, things that are well known. So if I get rid of the DNS traffic, which is what I expect there, I see that I've got UDP traffic, TCP traffic. I might want to take a look at those because this is somebody using 53 for things I don't expect. I've got some Kerberos traffic, some unknown stuff. I've got PC Anywhere. That seems really unusual, and PC Anywhere is somebody taking remote control of the system. It shouldn't be on port 53. I probably want to go figure out what that is. Um, and then I also see some interesting things in terms of the spike. So when did this happen? Uh, all of this traffic is happening at 1 o'clock in the morning. Uh, scary time. I don't have employees here doing this. So what's, what's really going on? And I can use this information to drill in and try to figure out, uh, is this worth investigating? Yeah, I would definitely want to spend a little bit more time here figuring out what's going on. Now, again, I'm cheating. I actually planted some of this information for the demo purposes, uh, but it all came from real things we saw in our network uh, over the last couple of years and have, have uh, gone through and investigated. And it's things that we see some very similar types of things going on at customers and clients. So now I've kind of walked through uh, some abnormal traffic based on both time, application, and destination, destination port. And I showed how to kind of take a quick walk through this with uh, some of the dashboards because we already have all that uh, analysis and uh, information going on. I'm going to go to another dashboard real quick. This one is classifying our traffic uh, by ingress, egress. So is data moving into our system or out of our system? And I can see, not surprisingly for the kind of company we are, we do a lot of data transfer back and forth. And in the last 24 hours, it's in a you know, large number of petabytes. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, get rid of my lateral traffic. And I'm actually going to, I think, okay, this should work. 
And now I'm just looking at traffic coming in or going out. And the way we define it is both by where is our destination port and our source port is the uh, IP address um, a 192 or a 10 or any of the, the true internal networks, or is it a publicly facing or publicly accessible IPv4 address? So we know where those servers or where those endpoints are. And then we look at uh, the byte flow. So are more bytes coming into the destination port or are more bytes going into the source port? And we have to take on both of these because of uh, you know typical web traffic as an example. The source is the browser, the destination is the server. But if you're going to something like Pandora, the traffic flow is all in. Whereas if you're going to Dropbox and moving a file, all the data flow is out. So you can't just go on where the endpoints are, you also have to go on the data flow. Now my 24 hour period, I'm, I'm already seeing some interesting trends jumping out. Uh, I've got a, a big file transfer to Amazon, happened about three o'clock yesterday. And this is by bandwidth. The next, uh, or sorry, by application, the next chart right below it is by IP address. So this big spike that went to Amazon, is it tied to the same IP address all the time or multiple IP addresses? And I can see that it came from one IP address. So one person inside Logarithm or one system inside Logarithm push a large file to Amazon. And I might go investigate that. Another little Amazon push here and another one there. And sure enough, all three of those are coming from 10.1.10.76. So it becomes really easy, again, fact-based investigation of what's going on. Uh, you see all sorts of interesting anomalies and uh, other things along here. So ingress traffic, what are we pulling into our network and when are we pulling it in? I can see that I sort of build up over the course of the afternoon and then I crash pretty hard at night because we're not pulling in a lot of data in the middle of the night. Uh, that's probably a good thing. Uh, but between these two views, I have a very quick correlation into am I seeing really chatty low bandwidth traffic that might be masking command and control or kind of low and slow type attacks? Am I seeing really big burst attacks or burst uh, information flow by egress? If I see this pattern happen regularly enough, I can go find that IP and figure out is it an automated system or is it uh, some uh, internal user that's uh, deciding that they've had enough bad days in a row and are transferring lots of data out uh, in preparation to either quit or to uh, you know, go do something bad with it. Um, we've run this dashboard as an example with some of our customers that focus on um, whether it's SOX compliance or just SEC compliance, or just looking at exfiltration of data. Just this view alone gives you a great starting point to go look at where information is flowing. So I have a couple of questions I want to throw uh, answers to here. One was uh, I'm really only showing the top 10 in most of these dashboards. Uh, it's really easy to create a bottom 10 as well, and we have uh, usually a separate dashboard for that to look at the, uh, the low volume traffic. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and jump to a different dashboard to show an example of that real quick. Uh, one of the things we like to talk about, especially from a demo, is uh, domains. Where are we going? Uh, which, you know, we, we like to say that we can block anything that's in the, the .ru or the .cn or the, you know, some, some well-known kind of risky top-level domains. Uh, but these days it gets harder and harder because some of those domains are being used uh, particularly on websites as um, uh, advertising uh, aggregator services. So even if you think you don't have any business having any traffic going to a .ru domain, just by going to a cnn.com you're going to see the traffic there because those ads are coming from an aggregator that has a .ru address. So we put together this dashboard to look at our high bandwidth top level domains, where do we spend a lot of time, as well as our low bandwidth ones, where are the rare ones. Uh, so at the top level domains, I can see you know, the vast majority of our traffic is .com. That's not surprising for an American company. Uh, a little bit of .net and a tiny little bit of EDU and then a smattering of other things, some, some orgs, and most of the rest of these are just going to be advertising sites. My bottom domains, uh, for CMS, I am totally unfamiliar with. 134 CMS, again, very unfamiliar with. A lot of these, I think, is uh, our internal labs team, again, running some traffic on us. Uh, .br is a valid country code. So we went to a .com, .br, but that's unusual. Uh, and then some other things like uh, that, that are showing up in here. So like a .la, I'm not sure where .la actually is, but I might want to go look at this, and I have no idea what Caramboa or cdata.caramboa is, whether that's an uh, advertising site or something I want to go be concerned about. So both my top level traffic and my bottom level traffic become really important in this type of an analysis. And then I can also look at it by time. You know, where are we spending most of our, our time on these sites? And again, we're looking here at the top level domains. We're very .com focused. Uh, second level domains, uh, it's 
bought XDCDN. That's a, an advertising site. The vast majority of our bandwidth at this particular time slot, just before lunch yesterday, uh, was going back and forth on advertising because we saw probably a lot of people hit the browsers right before they go out to lunch. And when you hit a browser page for any sort of news site these days, you are getting lots and lots of uh, bad domains as well, or advertising domains. I see the traffic change a little bit. So I have no idea, again, what pubmatic.com is, but I might want to go take a look at that because we had a lot of data that went uh, back and forth between it and a few others. I had a nice quiet period in the middle of the night. That's good. Uh, VCU.edu. Uh, I happen to know what that one is. That's uh, one of the mirror sites for, uh, our sorry, again, some of our CentOS and third-party stuff that we pull in for, for build process. Uh, but again, it gives me a great way to pull this data apart and get some really good fact-based evidence. Um, so this is kind of what we can do with dashboards. And again, this fundamentally is Kibana. So you can make your own widgets. You can do your own analysis. You can put together your own dashboard almost any way you want. So as an example, I had been uh, playing the other day with uh, just some DNS data, trying to look at the DNS traffic. And not a fancy dashboard, don't have a whole lot of widgets to it, but I was trying to pull out uh, you know, the host, where is it going to, what was the query that was asked and which, uh, which uh, address came back on that query. And it gets tricky because DNS is not, not necessarily the friendliest protocol to try to tease apart because it allows you to both make single requests and multiple requests, as well as the fact that when you make a DNS request, it may bounce through multiple DNS servers before you finally get the answer back. So I started by just saying, hey, let me make a table that, that shows me things that I might care about. And then I can start running some queries against this table and start refining what my dashboard might look like. So where I was trying to go with this was build something for our incident response team that allows them, for example, to say uh, how many different hosts or how many different IPs have resolved to a particular host name over the course of a, a certain amount of time frame. This is a common uh, research vector when you're trying to do uh, incident analysis or even threat hunting. So you can do all, all different kinds of things with these, uh, these dashboards. But I'm going to move on a little bit and take a look at uh, well, actually, let me go one other spot to show you our automation and our rules. So I have a number of rules that, uh, that we publish uh, inside the network monitor itself. These are what we call system rules. These are rules that anybody can turn on on any network, and they should work. Uh, in some cases, you may see more false positives, depending on exact, exactly how your network is set up. But what we've seen, uh, particularly with you know, customers trying out a freemium or, or setting up a network monitor for the first time, is that this collection of rules is always going to find interesting things for you. So some of these rules are supporting the dashboards, like this one that's uh, identified traffic direction. It's a rule that we put in place that looks at those IP addresses, compares whether they're internal or external, looks at the byte flow, and determines whether it's an, an ingress, egress, or, or lateral traffic. So all it's doing is adding metadata. Some of these are actually looking for security-related issues. So in this case, I'm looking for clear text passwords. I'm going to go ahead and zoom in a little bit on this so you can see the rule a little bit better. Uh, this is Lewis Script. It's, again, a very common, easy to pick up uh, scripting language. Uh, in this particular rule, we're going to, if we find a password, we're going to mask it. Uh, we're going to look for HTTP using basic authentication and pull the header information on it. And we're also going to, uh, to do a base64 decrypt, or a de sorry, decoding of that string because that's usually the only encryption you get on it is that uh, with uh, basic HTTP auth, they'll send us the username and password in clear text, uh, but it'll be base64 encoded, not encrypted, not salted, not hashed, not anything you want to see. So we're looking in this HTTP traffic for this uh, OAuth basic header. Uh, we're pulling out the username and password if we see it. We're doing this uh, decryption on it. And we're not going to store the password because we don't want to replicate the problem out into yet another system. We're going to store a master version of the password, which again should give you enough evidence to say, hey, this is a real problem. So this particular rule is a fun one to play uh, because in most environments, if you turn it on the first time and you start seeing hits, what we see is uh, we love to do single sign-offs. Uh, we love to have multiple systems, each with their own authentication, and try to get them to talk to each other and join together and not have our users have to type usernames and passwords over. But unfortunately, what we see is that a good number of those single sign-on systems don't actually use good encryption between them. So we saw this in our, our own environment, one of our own internal systems. Uh, we flagged on this rule. 
And again, as a, a product owner, this is one of those fun moments inside the company. I see the, the, the rule fire, and I go find the owner of that system, and I'm really excited to see that we have clear text passwords. And they're really upset about seeing clear text passwords because they thought they had secured the site. So kind of an interesting, uh, interesting little uh, scenario there for us. But we've seen this in customer sites as well of, of picking out these clear text passwords. We've got other rules looking for things like credit card numbers or uh, bank routing numbers. Uh, these have well-known patterns. Um, we can identify clear text versions of this data going out. Uh, we've got some additional coding that we've put into these system rules, particularly uh, these two for uh, removing false positives. Uh, it turns out the checksum algorithm in most credit card numbers is uh, nearly identical to the checksum algorithm used by uh, gzip and some of the other compression tools. So you end up with a lot of false positives if you're looking at uh, the, the gzip side of thing and not the un-gzip side. So these rules can be built for almost anything. And not only do we have a, a nice collection of uh, built-in system rules looking for personally identifiable information, looking for uh, an anomalous or bad network behavior, looking for known uh, attack vectors like uh, curl traffic inside of pastebin commands. Uh, this is, a, again, a well-known common attack vector. We can classify pastebin as an application, and we can actually look at what's being posted into pastebin, and if we see keywords that are typical kinds of things that are command and control activities, we'll alarm on that. Uh, but then you can write your own rules uh, to either enrich metadata, uh, alarm, and the third side of the, these rules give us is really incredibly fine-grained control over um, packet capture. So instead of being all on or all off, our packet capture can be controlled by application. I want to collect everything that's HTTP. Uh, or it can, through Lua rules, be controlled off of any of our metadata. I only want to capture packets going between this IP address and this IP address, or I want to capture all packets except for those going between this particular IP range. You can set all that up and do that very fine-grained, customized control uh, with these, uh, these, these rules. So where do we see these rules? Uh, if things are happening, I can go to my, my Alarms tab here. And I should see, yep, so I've got uh, some, some rules that I made just to, to look for Pandora traffic. I've got some deep script rules, so I'm looking and seeing a lot of things that are routing numbers. It's not surprising I ran a whole bunch of sample data through that, uh, that should trigger all of this earlier. Uh, so we see these alarms fire off. The other things that these alarms do is actually send data out over syslog uh, to our SIM. So anything that we trigger as an alarm here gets raised as a separate type of event inside of our SIM, which means that you can wire this directly into being an alarm in the web console and, and tied together with correlated, uh, perhaps through our, our AI, AI engine uh, with other systems and tools. Um, so automation, we can do a whole lot of things. Uh, dashboards, we can do a whole lot of things. We can replay our PCAPs. This is a quick example of that. I'll have a nice folder of samples. Just grab a whole bunch of them and replay them all back. And it's a pretty quick replay. So this is going to go back through the system. And I should actually, if I go back to my alarms here in just a second, I should see a lot more alarms uh, start showing up for these, uh, these uh, sessions that I just replayed back. And then I can go back into my, uh, my dashboards and start seeing that traffic uh, having come through. It can get a little uh, lost sometimes if you're looking at real traffic at the same time. And in this case, I am. I'm, I'm looking at our full uh, normal tap on our, our engineering switch. So what else can we do? Well, let me go to one more different dashboard here. I'm going to go to what we call our capture dashboard. We talked about that evidence. I want to have the, those PCAPs. In this case, we've got our capture sets to, uh, to capture certain protocols. And for any session that we've captured, I can find one that's interesting. So let me, let me pull this HTTP session. I uh, can download it. It's going to take a few seconds to, to find that in our storage, uh, extract it, pull it down. And now I get a zip file. And let me move my screen around. Uh, that contains that PCAP, and then I can open this PCAP either in, in Wireshark or any other tool that I want to do to, to do a deep inspection of that PCAP. So not only can you do this from the Netmon, but you can do this from our web console and our SIM as well. So if you're drilling into a log that came from our network monitor where we have the, uh, the backing PCAP, uh, you can go into the web console and, and through one click in the inspector, 
pull that PCAP down and then immediately attach it to a case uh, if you're going to do an investigation. So where are we going with Network Monitor? Obviously, we've, we've got a lot of power in place and a lot of uh, good things happening. I want to do a, a quick tour of uh, the version we're about to release in the next, uh, next week. Um, some of the things that have uh, changed is that we've redone the UI a little bit. There's a little bit of a different look and feel here because we're trying to bring it in line with a common styling to our, to our SIM. Uh, one of the first things that's different is our alarms. Instead of having just that table, I now have a full dashboard. So I can look at the alarms by severity, what's the lows and mediums. I can look at which rule fired the alarm. And I can get a nice table, like I'm seeing here, of how many different applications are firing my detect routing numbers, because that's going to help me figure out should I really dive into it or not. Uh, where is it coming from? Are these all coming from the same source IP and destination IP? Uh, or am I looking at uh, something really unusual where it's one particular system? So in this case, I have a suspicious top-level domain. I have traffic going to a .cn or .pk or one of those uh, top-level domains we know is, is problematic for us. I only have one application doing that. It's probably HTTP. And I'm only going from two browsers. So I have two places I want to go investigate as opposed to looking across my whole network, scanning across firewall, files, uh, trying to do a bigger correlation just to figure out where I want to go look. So the dashboard is pretty nice. The other nice thing about the dashboard is I can look at any of these sessions. So here's my suspicious TLD. And I have a hyperlink that's going to take me straight to my, my analyze dashboard. Uh, I can also expand these and just take a look. This is a, a DNS query that went to a .poland address. Interesting. Possibly, I'd, I'd want to look for a trend associated with it. I might want to go look for this, uh, the source IP and figure out what this, uh, what this system is doing, that it had a DNS query that went out to a, a .poland address. Uh, given the structure of this, I, I would almost guarantee it's probably somebody went to a, a browse to a website that had an ad service on it that went to dot, .pl. That's the, the number one thing we end up seeing. But I have all that information, again, just at the, at the, the touch. The other thing that uh, is different that I wanted to kind of focus on is our rules page. We moved it to the very top here. makes it much easier to see rules. So here's all my deep packet analytics rules. I can upload new ones. I can compose new ones. And then query rules, which I haven't talked about, are, are actually, let me go back to our original version. This uh, script up here at the top, any time that I wanted to look for something in particular. So let's see if anybody's, nobody's listening to Pandora in the last 15 minutes. I guess we're doing good today. Let's go 24 hours. Oh, because I'm on the capture. I have to get rid of my two filters here. So let me actually go to a different dashboard real quick. So I'm now looking at uh, all of the Pandora traffic, which again, as you expect, has certain behavior patterns associated with when people are working and likely to have their earphones on. I can actually save this as a rule and give it a name and a severity. And what's going to happen here is this is just a, a metadata query rule. It's not, not real complicated, not a whole lot of logic to it. But anything, anytime we see anything that matches this particular pattern, uh, particularly if I do things like uh, application, try a different one. So you looked at Netflix. So application Netflix, when were people on Netflix? And I can see that the biggest spike was uh, lunchtime, 1230. I can click Save Rule, give it a name. Uh, give it a severity. In this case, I'm going to say kind of low, at least for, as far as logarithm is concerned. Uh, when I save it, it's going to tell me how many times it would have fired. So this is a, a nice feature because it, it helps me prevent rules that are just going to be overly chatty in terms of alarms. Uh, we've got a lot of Netflix, which if it were against our corporate policy, I, I might be really concerned here and need to do an education campaign or uh, figure out how to change my firewall rules to block things. Uh, so I can go ahead and say, yeah, I want to, I want to have that rule. Um, and again, I'll start seeing those in my alarms page. So what, what we've done in our new version is consolidated all of that just right up here at the top, makes it much easier to find and much easier to work with. So how do you want to learn more and work with the network monitor? Uh, I'm going to jump back for a second to a couple of slides. Uh, we sell network monitor like we sell our SIMs, so we have uh, full logarithm appliances if you wanted to buy a good enterprise-grade rack-mounted system. Uh, we also have instructions we've posted on our community site now, or I think I'm just about to post on our community site, about how to use our freemium version and deploy it to things as small as micro-PCs. 
Uh, in this case, we've actually been uh, pretty successful deploying to like Intel NOOCs. They're like about four inches by four inches. And they become really awesome like uh, penetration testing drop boxes or part of an incident response toolkit. Uh, we also have virtual machine deployments. If you go to our freemium site and want to just mess with a network monitor quickly, we have a complete uh, virtual box environment that is designed to uh, get you up and going and show you what traffic your own laptop is seeing. So this virtual box environment is already pre-deployed, pre-configured, set up to read whatever traffic is going across your wireless connection. And it's a great way to play with both network monitor as well as to start understanding what your own laptop is doing, which is often pretty scary. Uh, and then, of course, in terms of, of capture, for the enterprise grade, we're, we're typically talking about a tap or spam port on a, a core switch somewhere. Uh, at a home environment, we've seen a lot of deployments here with our freemium. We're looking at uh, basically trying to jump in between the modem and the router, or if you have a, a router that's capable of doing port mirroring, set up a port mirror and then plug the, the uh, capture interface into that. And then again, the local traffic on the VM. So we have a freemium version. You can download this right now and start playing with it. Uh, it gives you access to everything you just saw me do. Uh, if you want more, the extra things that you get are forwarding not just the alarms to the network monitor or to, to the SIM, but forwarding a record of every single uh, network flow to the SIM is something that's in our license feature, and then some higher rates for uh, data processing and higher length of time for uh, storage and uh, data retention. So enterprise is all about, or our, our license version and our enterprise version is really all about uh, storing more data for longer and also getting more data into a SIM environment. But the freemium has all the same features, all the same dashboards, all the same system rules, everything you just saw me, saw me show. Uh, the other thing I want to kind of hit on is we have a, a great community site now for freemium. This is separate from the main logarithm community. You don't actually have to be a logarithm customer to get access to it. Uh, just create an account. And in that community, you can find uh, discussion boards about how to set up and run with Network Monitor, as well as a whole separate section of what we call community rules. So all of those uh, system rules that I showed you, we have another whole collection of probably uh, you know, 10 or 15 at least now, if not more, um, rules that, that just didn't quite make the cut of being universally applicable. The rules where before you deploy them, you have to make some changes. You're looking for specific things that may or may not be in your network. Or the rules that are, are much more uh, narrow in scope and probably not as valuable to everybody. So if you go to the community site, you can find those rules. You can add your own rules. You can post questions about it uh, and go from there. So if you're interested in anything that you just saw, uh, you should have an attachments and links uh, function on the, uh, the dashboard that you're looking at. It's one of the tabs across the bottom. Uh, inside that, we've got the links to our freemium download page, uh, as well as to uh, how to schedule an online demo. And uh, you can always go to logarithm.com and uh, connect with us there. So at this point, I'm actually going to shift over from sort of presentation mode to answering some questions, because we've got a few stacked up. So one of the first questions is uh, defining, you know, can we define labels on the destination ports to be displayed as the application name instead? Uh, there's some things you can do there easily, and there's some things that you can't that are, that are kind of limited by what, what Kibana does. In the case of our destination ports dashboard, uh, we left the port as the port number. There's some things you could do, with, like relabeling all of them. Because we wanted to find cases like this in uh, DNS, the destination port is 53. We expect 100% traffic, but the fact that we have 99.9% .9 traffic is kind of scary. I want to go figure out what that 0.1% that, that is, because it's stuff that is not DNS on 53. So I'm always a little hesitant with doing uh, you know, relabels like that unless they are, are really 100% accurate. In this particular case, I'm not sure I would, because it would, uh, it would hide this particular incident from me of somebody using a well-known open port for something that's not supposed to be there. Um, got a question about uh, working with SSL. So inside our network monitor, uh, we obviously can't read SSL traffic. We don't know what the payload is. But we definitely do know um, the, the signal information. Who is talking? Uh, which ports are they using? Sometimes we can tell which application it actually is if, it's, if uh, there's certain header information that we can pull. Um, we can pull 
the bandwidth of how much data is going from where to where. And we can also pull things like the um, uh, information inside of the SSL cert and start giving you information to, to look at there. Uh, also, beyond what just the straight Netmon can do, we have tested and partnered with a number of the uh, SSL decryption vendors to do inline decryption. So if you have uh, A10 Thunderbolt, uh, Bluecoat, uh, Gigamon, and I believe that there may be one other, but it's escaping me this morning, uh, that we've officially certified with. So if you put one of their SSL decryptors in line and then feed us the output, we will properly parse and uh, process all of that output. So although we ourselves will not do SSLD directly, uh, we, will, we will certainly read and respond well to other devices that do. Uh, so SSL is tough. A lot of those SSL decryption and devices are, are focused on essentially kind of man in the middle or, or certificate management, which is a, a, in my mind anyway, a time frame where it's going to work for a little while, but then as those technologies keep changing, and we're already seeing that change, uh, it gets harder and harder. Um, it's a tough problem. I think there's there's some long range directions that we're looking at about how to how to work with it. But uh, you know we're we're constantly fighting that battle. We want things to be secure, but there are times when we want to look inside the security. And this is this is really kind of becoming one of the honestly one of the great questions of our, our particular generation. Uh, second side of this is not just SSL but cloud. Cloud is a major trend. We see a lot of information going into the cloud and a lot of server systems going into the cloud, and good and bad. When you go to the cloud, you do not necessarily have access to the network traffic. There's no 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 equivalent or nice equivalent to, you know, show me the uh, the tap of the network switch. You know, Google's not going to let you do that. Amazon's not going to let you do that. Microsoft's not not going to let you do that. They don't want you to know anything at all about that infrastructure because you're you're paying them to take care of it for you. So we're looking at a couple of systems along uh, cloud side right now. Uh, again, with a couple of partners uh, on how to put some essentially agents in the cloud that can, can read data and send it back to us of network traffic on a, on a per uh, cloud server instance. Uh, it's a tough problem as well, but it's something that we're, we're actively trying to look into. Um, in the meantime, though, just information going to from the cloud, you can still capture an awful lot of what's happening from the usage of cloud environments uh, with Network Monitor as it is. And we've seen a number of cases where that has come into play with our customers is that they're they're focusing very heavily on looking for connections to both controlled cloud environments. In our case, Office 365 is a controlled environment. We moved a lot of stuff up there. We want to know our our own employees using it and taking advantage of it. And the network traffic to and from Office 365 gives us a great cross check of what Microsoft tells us about usage, uh, as well as helps us look for like security breaches and, and other things uh, going wrong. So we can do a lot of passive detection and classification of cloud applications. And then we can also detect uncontrolled cloud applications. We can take a, a good look for, uh, take a quick example. Anybody go to Dropbox? And yeah, we've got some Dropbox activities. Uh, got a big uh, file transfer to Dropbox uh, yesterday. Or actually, I think that was just a few minutes ago. Uh, and I can figure out who's, who's headed there and, and uh, kind of go do some analysis and extraction of you know, what happened. And even if even if this is SSL, which often it is on this, this port 443, I still have evidence of access to it. And I uh, and again, in our, our version here, we have Dropbox uh, application classification that will actually break apart uh, uploads and downloads. So even though it's 443, I, I do know for sure that that user from this IP address to Dropbox moved a, a file of a certain size and can get a lot of good intel out of that. Another question about an API. Um, there's a number of things that we already have API endpoints exposed for inside of Network Monitor. Uh, most of them are ones that we've uh, attached from our SIM. In particular, that's, that's pull down the PCAP files that get information about the session and uh, pull down a file reconstruction inside of uh, emails as an example. Uh, we're actually heavily building out that API to both enrich the query side, which I think is what this, uh, this question is fundamentally about, uh, as well as to enrich the control side. So if you wanted to have multiple NetMons because of either a network topography or uh, bandwidth or whatever, and you wanted to be able to control whether these rules are on or off at any given time, uh, 
instead of having to manually go into each net one and turn them on or off, we're, we're building out the API to let you do that automatically from more of a kind of single pane of glass management solution. Uh, yes, uh, another question of can you see the SSL TLS version for traffic? Absolutely. Uh, we will show you, um, let me go to a right dashboard for it. Probably this is just here. I can type, can uh, drill down to SSL. And inside my table here, this is all the, the metadata that we're pulling. So what I should have is a, uh, let's just scroll right past it. I think I scrolled right past it. There's a, a field specifically for the TLS and SSL version, and it'll show you whether it's a SSL uh, 2, SSL 3, TLS 1.0, 1, 1, 1, 2, and you can filter on all of that. A um, couple more questions. Uh, kind of comparing network monitor to an intrusion detection system. I'm not sure that uh, I would necessarily say that uh, NetMon can replace an IDS. One of the things you often get with an IDS that we don't currently uh, do with NetMon is you get that feed of uh, signatures for, for what an intrusion looks like. There's certainly some aspects of an IDS and in, in smaller environments, I think you can actually do a lot of what an IDS does with Network Monitor, but we're aimed at different purposes. IDS at the end of the day fundamentally is still essentially a, a firewall. It's gonna say yes or no on, on traffic. Whereas Network Monitor, we are really heavily focused on this, uh, this threat detection and incident response side. So we're trying to do more of an analysis viewpoint of what is this traffic? Is it suspicious? Is it malicious? Is it a problem for me from a security perspective? Is it a problem from an operational perspective? Uh, is it a problem from just a knowledge sharing perspective across teams in the company? Uh, whereas an IDS has a very different focus associated to it. In a, in a larger enterprise system, I think you want the IDS anyway because you want defense in depth and you want multiple layers that are going to look at different things. You know, network monitor is not necessarily focused on trying to prevent the initial entry. It's focused on trying to give you the evidence to understand when that entry happened and what it hit and where it went to and uh, how to respond to it. So a little bit of different focus, which often means that having two systems is still, is still better than one if you can afford it and, and uh, have the time inside of it. Again, there's, there's definitely overlap between the two, but we don't position Network Monitor as being an intrusion detection system. Uh, and we see that in, in cases where you've got a good IDS, Network Monitor becomes a great uh, validation, second tier, and evidence source behind the IDS. Uh, so use them together, uh, you know, not, a, not necessarily a replacement would be the, the way that I'd put it. Uh, one of the questions that I, I have a couple of variants on the same question is trying to identify the process that is making the call. And unfortunately with Network Monitor, we're not looking at endpoints. So we don't know exactly what's generating that traffic on the system. We just know that the that, that, uh, traffic has left the computer and gone out to the NIC. So once it hits the network interface card is, is basically when we capture it, which means all that process information is already uh, lost to us. If you want to look at the process information, that's where uh, we would pair very well with our SIM product and looking at the agents that are, are running on the, the endpoints to, to try to look at that process information. And then we can correlate between them. Um, we also uh, just did a tips and, trips, tips and tricks webinar uh, that you can get access to off of logarithm.com uh, just last week. That was a, a two-part session. One part was looking at our integration with Carbon Black, which does a, a beautiful job of looking at those processes compared to, or uh, joined with Network Monitor where you, the Carbon Black is going to look at what's going on in the endpoint, but uh, Network Monitor gives you the information about what's happened after it's either left the endpoint or as it's coming into the endpoint. And the two of them together become a, a really, really great security story for, again, tracking that process down, not just the application and the port and the protocol, the stuff that we can find on the network side, but actually which process on the system is, is doing that without Without the process, you can't necessarily resolve the issue, but without the network traffic, you don't necessarily even know that that process is causing a problem. So it's, it's a story, again, you watch the Tips and Tricks webinar, you can kind of see how they play together and become a, a much better together type solution. Uh, one more question. 
on uh, tra traffic pattern base landing and anomaly alerting. Inside of the NetMon itself, we're mostly looking at uh, that kind of an analysis through visual dashboards and graphs or through DPA rules. And we have some DPA rule examples that, uh, that look time-based at certain things and say this is anomalous. Uh, our better version of that is actually to tie together with the, the logarithm sim environment where we can take this, uh, this net, uh, what we call smart flow data, this record of each of these uh, sessions, and run it into AI Engine, which is optimized and designed specifically for that kind of baselining and anomaly detection. That's an also area in, in, inside Logarithm where we're putting a lot of investment in uh, kind of the next year or so as, as building out this anomaly and pattern detection. Uh, right now, we're, we're also, in addition to AI Engine, we're doing a lot of work looking at the user, user behavioral analysis that same process we're doing with users, we swap in this network data source and we start being able to do network traffic anomaly detection, uh, which is really where I think we're going to long-term go with this, is that our, our best answer to that is going to be tying network monitor as a data source into the analysis that's already inside the SIM. So once again, uh, go to that attachments and links. Uh, we've got links to the freemium download. We've got links to our community forum, as well as links if you want to request a more detailed technical demo. I uh, want to thank everybody for their time and their questions. If I didn't answer your question, we'll uh, get back to you uh, offline um, or, again, post it on the forums, and we'll, we'll absolutely see it there. Uh, Howard, Colby, am I missing anything? All right. I think we'll that's ahead. it. Thank you, right, everybody, so we'll for your time. Um, Rob, good job, and we'll talk to everybody very soon. All right. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your day. Bye. Right.